What do we need to have at our disposal in order to define continuous functions? When you look at the definition that comes from real analysis, you might think that we need arithmetic to define continuity because we have to subtract values. You might think that we need uh, a measurement of size or distance or some kind of geometry because we have those absolute values in the definition. Um, in the previous video, I tried to convince you that we don't actually need those things in general, that we can come up with ways of defining what it means for a function to be continuous that are purely topological, right? that just relate to topological notions of things like open sets and open neighborhoods. And so we're going to continue along that thought process in this video to, first of all, recall the open set definition of what it means for a function to be continuous, and then push it just a little bit further to think about how we can use sequences, and in particular, convergent sequences of points, as a way of defining continuity as well. So in the previous video, we were introduced to the open set definition of continuity that said what it means for a function to be continuous at x0 is that for any epsilon greater than 0, however close we want to try to get to x0, we can get that close to f of x0 uh, by choosing x's that are close enough within delta of x0. And in a sort of set theoretic, a topological formulation, what that tells us is that for any epsilon greater than zero, we can find a delta greater than zero, such that the delta ball around x naught is a subset of the inverse image of the epsilon ball around f of x naught. So to get a picture of that, let's suppose I have the graph of a function that is purportedly continuous at x naught. And so that means I have a point here, x naught on the x-axis, and its image, f of x naught, on the y-axis. It says that if I plant my feet here at f of x naught on the y-axis and I stretch out my arms some epsilon distance, then this green interval here is going to be playing the role of the epsilon ball around f of x. And what it says is if I look at the inverse image of that epsilon ball, remember what that does is it takes all of the y values of these points and it just sort of looks at what are the x values on the x-axis for which the y values belong to this set. And so here we're going to get this sort of purple shaded values here on the x-axis, and it could be a really messy looking set. Right? In this example, it looks like because we're kind of catching a little piece of this graph here, and then also a big piece of this graph over here, that the inverse image could be you know, a pretty big and nasty. We don't really have much understanding of what it would look like. But what do we need to be true in order to conclude that f is continuous at this point x0? Well, we just need to be able to find a delta pole any delta ball. There must exist a delta greater than zero, such that the delta ball around x0 is entirely contained within this inverse image. So I should be able to stand at the point x and stretch out my arms a delta distance and have everything that I touch be a part of the inverse image of the epsilon ball. So that was the open set definition. And I call it the open set definition because the only thing we need to know in order to make this definition is what open neighborhoods mean and what inverse images of, of sets mean. And those are both purely set theoretic and topological ideas. We don't need arithmetic, we don't need geometry. Well, open sets are not the only way to sort of think about what might be a purely topological idea. Open sets are in fact what we use first and foremost to define what topology is. Um, but as soon as we start defining open sets and topology, the next thing that we often wanna do is to speak about sequences. What does it mean for a sequence of points in a topological space to converge to a limit point in that topological space? And so let's see if we can reformulate continuity using sequences rather than just using open sets. So what would a sequential definition of continuity look like? So in order to do that, I think what I would first look at, what first comes to my mind is the similarity in the epsilon and delta definition of continuity that comes from the epsilon and delta definition of the limit of a function, that seems awfully similar in kind to the definition of convergence for a sequence, the epsilon and n definition for convergence of a sequence that we have from our first semester of real analysis. And that is sort of where we want the story to begin. Here's my mental picture. The definition of being continuous at x0 means that I can get as close to the limit, f of x0, as you would want me to, just by getting as close to the, image, the, the domain point, x0, as I need to. But then what does it mean to sort of get close to something? We can get close to something by kind of arbitrarily choosing an x which is delta close to x0, but we can also get arbitrarily close to something by walking along 
a convergent sequence whose limit is that point. So this is the idea. Right? What if we try to get as close to x0 as we need to just by following the points of a convergent sequence whose limit is x0? If I do that, then do I have a sequence of image points, f of x1, f of x2, and so forth, what happens to the, uh, uh, the images of the points in that sequence? If I make my sequence points as close to x0 as we could ever hope for, then should it be the case that the images of those points get as close to f of x0 as you might want us to? And the answer ends up being yes. And that's the content of the sequential definition of continuity, but I like to think of this not as a definition, but really as a theorem, right? If we kind of take this definition of continuous as our definition, then we kind of have to deduce a definition for what it means for a function to be continuous with respect to convergent sequences. So here's how it works. f is a continuous function at x0. If whenever we have a sequence of points in the domain of my function, so I have to be able to evaluate f at every one of the points in this sequence, and if that sequence of points converges to x0, so I'm just going to take any convergent sequence of points in the domain of my function whose limit is the x0 that I'm interested in. So what should we be able to deduce? We should be able to deduce that as we go along that sequence of points in the domain that are getting arbitrarily close to x0, if my function is continuous, that means that the images of those points should get arbitrarily close to f of x0. And so this is what the definition of sequential continuity ends up looking like. And you can almost sort of see the proof almost in this picture up here in the top. Right? That if I know my function is continuous, then we know that the inverse image of this green epsilon ball is going to contain a purple delta ball. And that this convergent sequence of points that limits on x0 will have to eventually enter that delta ball and never leave by definition of the convergence of a sequence. And therefore, the images of those points will necessarily enter the epsilon ball around f of x0 and never leave. And from that, we'll be able to deduce that this sequence of image points is convergent to f of x0. So that was me talking through the argument that we're going to make in the proof in just a minute. Before we do that, I also want to kind of reimagine this conclusion just a little bit. To say that the limit of the values of the function along my sequence, the limit of the f of xn's, is equal to f of x0, and then remember that x0 itself is the limit of the sequence of x's, we can also use this to say that if I have a convergent sequence of input values, they get sent to a convergent sequence of output values by my continuous function. Or seen another way, the limit of the f of xn's ends up being f of the limit of the xn's because that's what x0 means. So yet another way to understand continuity is that continuous functions are those which commute with limits of sequences. So the limit of a sequence of f values is the same thing as f of the limit of that sequence of f values. So the f and the limit can trade places. And whether or not a limit can trade places with something is one of the biggest questions in all of analysis. Here we're seeing an example of what it means for a function to be able to trade places with a limit. And continuity is what's necessary in order for a function to trade places with limit. So let's just fill in a few of the basic details of the proof that I sort of gave you an outline of in this picture just a minute ago. Recalling the definition of convergent sequence. If I happen to know that my xn values in my domain, my red sequence of points up here, converges to x0, that means that for any epsilon greater than 0, we can find a capital N natural number such that all of the little n's past that capital N will satisfy absolute value of xn minus x0 less than epsilon. So in other words, however close you want to get to the limit of the sequence, we can get that close to the limit of the sequence for all of the points past a certain point. We can, we, however close you want me to get, if I go far enough out in the sequence past capital N, all of the points in my sequence that have an index that's larger than capital N will be epsilon close to the limit. So how do we deploy that definition as part of this proof? Let me give you the outline. Um, there are a few things to prove here, and I'm just going to kind of give the flavor of one of them. Let's prove the assertion that if f is a continuous function at x0, and xn is a convergent sequence of points in the domain that converges to x0, we're going to try to deduce that f of xn converges to f of x0. So how might we do that? Well, in order to establish this convergent sequence assertion, 
we need to show that for any epsilon greater than zero, we can find a capital N such that all of the little n's past that capital N will satisfy absolute value of f of x n minus f of x naught is less than epsilon. And so then we would think, all right, so how, do I, how am I going to get the points in my sequence? How am I going to get these green dots here to be within epsilon distance of f of x naught? Well, in order to get my f values within epsilon of f of x naught, I'll probably end up invoking the continuity of my function f to force my x values to be delta close to x naught. And so the first sort of step backwards from the end of my proof is going to be using the continuity of f to turn the epsilon into a delta. And once my x values are within delta of x naught, I, I ask myself, how do I make that happen? How do I know I can get my x values within delta's distance of x naught? And I know I can do that because we have a convergent sequence of input values that converges to x naught. So I can get my xn's within delta of x naught just by choosing my little n's to be large enough beyond capital N. So this is the, the main sketch out of the proof that what we're going to do is we're going to let this delta that we picked at the beginning of the, sorry, let this epsilon at the beginning of the proof determine the delta. It's going to determine the, the radius of how close do we need to get to x naught. And then we'll use that radius delta to determine how far out into the sequence of x1, x2, x3, how far out do we need to go before the whole rest of my sequence is within delta of x naught. So we'll let the epsilon determine our delta, and then we'll let that delta determine our capital N. So when we write out these details, the first thing we invoke is the definition of continuous function, because we know f is continuous at x naught. There is a delta such that all of the x's that are within delta's distance of x naught will have f of x values that are within epsilon of f of x naught. So now we have our delta in the proof. This is the delta that gets us epsilon close to f of x naught. And then we're going to use that delta to determine n, invoking the definition of convergent sequence. By the definition of convergent sequence, there is a capital N, natural number, such that all of the little n's past capital N are going to satisfy that that nth term of my sequence is within a delta's reach of x naught. And then we just have to connect this assertion to this last assertion over here. And that, once again, is connected by the definition of continuity. So as long as I'm picking a little n that's greater than or equal to capital N, we will have absolute value of xn minus x naught less than delta. And therefore, xn will be one of these x's that's within delta's distance of x naught. And therefore, by continuity, f of that xn will be within epsilon of f of x naught. And that completes the proof. So we can use sequences as a way to define what continuity is. Continuity means you give me a convergent sequence of inputs, and the function will produce for me a convergent sequence of outputs. Continuous functions take convergent sequences to convergent sequences. So now we have two richly topological ideas for what continuous functions ought to be and what they ought to do. Continuous functions should be things for which the inverse images of open sets are open sets. And continuous functions should be things where the forward image of convergent sequences remain convergent sequences. So you might notice that one of the things that might make this definition better in some cases than in others is whether we need to make an argument based on forward direction or inverse image direction. Right? If I need to make an argument based on inverse image direction, it's probably more convenient for me to use the open set definition, because we know continuous functions are those for which the inverse image of open sets are open sets. Whereas if I, I know something about the domain of my function, I'm trying to deduce something about the codomain, then I might want to use a forward image argument. There, it might be more convenient for me to use the fact that continuous functions take convergent sequences of points in the domain. The forward image of a convergent sequence will remain a convergent sequence. So we're beginning to see that not only is continuity a topological property, but it also has these different disguises that it can wear. And we can choose which one is going to fit the argument that we need to make strategically and hopefully successfully along the way. So in the next couple of videos, we're going to take this a little bit further and figure out how the topological understanding of continuous functions is going to let us immediately deduce some of the specific properties of continuous functions that we learned in calculus for functions of a single real variable. So this is the, the next exciting couple of videos are where we really get to start reaping some of the bounty of results about continuous functions from our calculus class that we now are not going to have to work too hard to obtain because we have this rich topological understanding of what continuous functions are. Don't miss it.